Verse number 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, is? And they said, some say you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And so Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon, Bar or Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Come on, somebody. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Now, you can't just read the word. You got to read the word. Mine's got an exclamation mark. Jesus is pumped. My boy, Peter, you got it. Because up till now, Jesus has not revealed who he is. And he's excited because they got it. Because, uh, listen, he's been teaching, he's been preaching, he's been healing, he's been feeding the 5,000, he's been doing what Jesus do. And yet, God Almighty, that's why the next line is so powerful. Jesus is excited because, God, you revealed who I am to them, and they heard it. It shows promise, it shows hope, it shows power in the gift of the Spirit. It's communicating on behalf of the Father. Listen to what he says. He said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, my Daddy in Heaven revealed that to you. Man, there's approval of the Father. You're letting it out, God. You're letting the world know I'm your son, I'm your boy, praise God. Man, that's, you got to get more excited about that. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If you remember the church this morning, you excited. I said, if you remember the church this morning, that would excite you. Now listen, let's go ahead and clarify. And I know you know, but I'm going to treat you like you don't. He wouldn't say, lay down, Peter. We've been to build a temple on top of you. <laughs> He was saying the revelation you just revealed yeah. at the revelation of my father to you is what we are about to build the church on. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the world needs Jesus. Yeah. I'm just, listen, we can blame it on anything we want to. Politics, poverty, disaster, meanness. You can blame it on anything. But the truth is, when it's all said and done, the world needs Jesus. And God sent Jesus to the world. And then Jesus sent the church to the world. <laughs> but he didn't just send them. He sent them with a revelation of who he was to say, hey, I didn't just tell you about me. I just lived it live in front of you. I let you know who I really am and how this life can be lived. And I gave you a gospel that you didn't have before except for in prophecy. But now the prophecy has been fulfilled that the lamb has went to the slaughter. That the house is now being resurrected. Resurrected. Uh, you can tear it down, but it will be built again. Why? Because the Son of God uh, has come, and I'm sending you forth with a message to the world. Now listen to me. If that's the case, if that's the case, the church cannot, it must not fail. And if you're not careful, you can look at the church and see a lot of failure. If you're not careful, you can see a lot of diminishing, whether it's in power. He said, listen, they, they, they have my name, but they deny the power of it. In other words, they ain't living the righteousness of it. I understand that there's a culture out there that's not having an impact. Oh, they call themselves the church, but they look so much like the world that you can't distinguish between the two. Now, I'm old, but I'm not that old to be old school. I just know that the old school has some new school ideas that still work today. And holiness is still holiness. Uh, Oh, some of you got nervous. Put your shoes on. Hang on now. Holiness is still holiness. And he said, be holy as I am holy. Not work on it as you can. We got a gospel message. The world needs Jesus. I want to look at the statement here. I will build my church. Now, I'm going to break it down. Look at your neighbor and say, he's about to break it down. Well, you just left the neighbor out. Just hope they'll forgive you. Go to the other one. Tell, now, just tell yourself. He's about to break it down. Now, the first point of my message is this. And there's five or six of them, so hang with me. 
I haven't preached in five weeks. It's a series. I'm bringing it to you one day. Hang on. <laughs> you got the power of I. We're not just talking about, no, not just anybody said I will build my church. Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God just declares, I will build my church. At the revelation of him, who he is and what he is and who he is in the, in the eyes of the Father, he's just made a declaration. Now, knowing this is happening, I'm excited about it, Peter. And now I can assure you with a promise of all promises, I will build my church. But it's not just anybody saying it. Now, a few years ago, there's a video came out entitled, That's My King. Many of you have probably seen it, not all of you. I'm not going to assume all of you have, because hopefully some of you come from the non-church world into the church world. And in that, it uses the sermon of a, a preacher, Reverend S.M. Lockridge. He was a pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, a prominent African-American congregation located in San Diego, California, who was known for his preaching. Now, I can sit up here and tell you all about Jesus, but the truth is, there's those times in life that you come across things that there's no better way to describe him. <laughs> can I just be real with you? So if you allow me a little liberty this morning, I want to read this video to you. The words used, this sermon, and I can't help it, I'm going to slip into a black brother voice every now and then. I'm not good at it, but I'll give you what I got. You, you, you understand where I'm at? And so you just stay with me, and what I need you to do is sleep in your black soul response. Ain't nobody have church like black folks. I preached in a lot of them, let me just tell you. Ain't nobody have church like the black folks. I prayed a long time to be the only white guy in a building of black folks as the pastor. That's what I'd like to have. Nothing against you white people. It's just the way it is. If you want to have church, I'm playing. I'm playing. Y'all don't be mean to me. Don't you be mean to me. The reverend says, my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure. Let me just start over because I started the wrong verse. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews, the king of Israel, the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Now that's my king. I, I wonder if you know him. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. I said, I just wonder, do you know him? Uh, he's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of the world. He's God's son. Uh, he's a sinner savior. He's a centerpiece uh, of civilization. Uh, he's unparalleled. Uh, he's unprecedented. Uh, I said, he's the loftiest ideas in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior. I said, I wonder, do you know him this morning? Uh, he supplies strength for the weak. Uh, he's available for the tempted uh, and the tried. Any of you in here this morning? Uh, he sympathizes uh, and he saves. Uh, he strengthens uh, and he sustains. Uh, he guards and he guides. Uh, he delivers captors. Uh, he defends the feeble. Uh, he blesses the young. Uh, he serves the unfortunate. Uh, he regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meager. I wonder, does anybody in here know who I'm talking about? He's the key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. And he's the gateway of glory. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His his mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you, but he's indescribable. <laughs> he's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your hands. You can't live. You can't outlive him, and you 
I can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. I said, that's my key. Come on, y'all. justice, but I like his words. Amen. Ooh, baby, we got to walk more next week. <laughs> I feel like a fat boy been at the buffet too long. Ooh. He must have been in better shape at 85 than I was. There's power in I. He better listen to who's saying it. Ah, Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, I'm not here to do something that ain't been already being done. I'm here to throw gas on a fire that's already burning. <laughs> I, <laughs> I've been watching Pastor Joe's Facebook and social media. I know what's happening around here. There's a new fire been fanning around. Come on, y'all. There's a new fire being fanning around here. I'm not here to do what he can't do. I'm just here to throw a little gas on it for him. Say, there you go, brother. Fan that flame. Let's go to the next place. Amen. Yeah. Now, you got the power of I. And he got the promise of will. I will. Now you English teachers in here, you know and understand the power of that word. It is future tense and conclusive. He's not saying it may happen, it could happen. We get lucky maybe to take place. No. <laughs> Jesus said I will. I already see it happening. Matter of fact, I'm Alpha and I'm Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm as much there as I am here now. And so what he says is I'm standing here at the end of time and I'm looking and my bride's doing all right. Because <laughs> I said back then I would and here I am now done done it, praise God. Why? Because he said I've made a promise. I will build my church. Mm. Declared it's done. I mean, you know, all the promises of God are yes. And in him, amen. There's the power of the amen. In him, amen. That means it's not dependent on all of us. That's right. I will build my church. Listen, the promises of God will come true. He says, I am not man that I can lie. You know why that is? You ever thought about why that is? He's God. He can do anything. No, no, no. He can't because he's speaking those things that be not as though they were because the moment they leave his mouth, it is. How you going to lie? Because everything you say suddenly is right. Everything you say suddenly exists. Everything you say, there it is. It's impossible to lie because the moment he speaks it, it comes into existence. Glory to God. Listen, if he lied about yesterday, yesterday would change the moment he said it was what it was. <laughs> I don't know about you, but as an old sinner, I like the fact that God can change my past. <laughs> I like the fact that he can say he's no longer who he was. He is what I said he was going to be. He's no longer that he was yesterday. He is who he is. You can't look at people based on their yesterday. You got to look at what God's done in them today. Praise God. And you can't judge him for yesterday because God said the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Why? Because the moment he moved into your life, he said, I cast your sins as far as the east is from the west uh, to the sea to be remembered no more. I don't even know what you're talking about. Why? Because the moment I made you new, you were new. Praise God. Mm. The promise of God will come true despite and regardless of the opposition. The promise of God will come true despite and regardless of the magnitude of the task. That's a lot of work to do here. He walked through this building and showed me. There's a lot of work to do here. To look at it, you're going, oh, whew. I don't know how we'll ever do it, preacher. It ain't depending on the preacher. Yeah. It's depending on God building his church. Yeah. And he said, I will. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, y'all. He said, I will. And guess what? He will. Right. Mm, praise God. Despite and regardless of the impossibility of the vision. You can't get too big if it's a God-given vision. It ain't vision until it gets to where you can't and God can. It ain't vision until it gets to where you can't and only He can. <laughs> now you envision. Come on, y'all. <laughs> Listen, the church we just walked away from so stupidly. In the flesh. And spiritually, it's brilliant. But in the flesh, it's just stupid. I know I've had a lot of my preachers belly tell me I was stupid. And in the flesh, they're right. In the spirit, though, <laughs> I'm going to be looking at them one day going, huh, who's stupid now? <laughs> But I remember when we got there in 1990, actually 2000, January 1st of 2000, we were Y2K people. 
And uh, 55 little people there <laughs> just want to have church, man. So we come in there and just a few weeks into it, God told this young fiery preacher, sell the church. Well, you don't sell people's church. That's not cool. Especially when you're the only new guy there. <laughs> So, man, God was moving, and I said, hey, if you say sell it, we'll sell it. So I went to the board and said, guys, God said sell the church. They said, awesome, let's do it. I thought, well, that's nuts. So I go to the front of the whole church. I said, church, I'm here to tell you God spoke to me, and he said to sell the church. They gave a standing ovation. I said, this is a house full of nuts. So I talked to my friends to get some wisdom. I said, no, brother, I'll just be honest with you, brother Jeff. It takes years to sell a church. I said, oh, we could then. We go on vacation on Monday. This is on Sunday. I told the church on Monday we go to SeaWorld. We get to SeaWorld. We just mind our business and join the dolphins. Waiting for the whale show. And then my, my cell phone rings. Had the old flip phone. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> And this little old lady on the other end, she said, is this Brother Calhoun? I said, yes, ma'am. What can I do for you? We'd like to buy your church. <laughs> so I think the deacons are being way too cruel. I said, all right, that's stupid. You, what are y'all doing? Huh? I said, yeah, I, you know what? I tell you what, I'm on vacation. I'll be home Thursday or Friday. I'll give you a call, okay? And I'm thinking, them crazy deacons. I got to them nuts. They just messing with me. Because yeah. I'd put on a little marquee out front that had a little slide-in letters. You know them don't matter. And if you can't find enough letters, you got to put the little red numbers here and flip them upside down. Like some of your car tag read. You know what I'm talking about. And so, so I'd put on there, this church is for sale, and put my cell phone number. Oh, we're going to be late today. I'm just telling you. And so I get home. I haven't given this little old lady another thought. And the phone rings at church. Or my cell phone does. I'm at the church. Is this Brother Calhoun? I thought, oh my God, these guys just won't let it go. I said, yes, ma'am, what can I do for you? We'd like to buy your church. I said, I'll tell you what, you come on over here to the church and we'll talk about it. Well, 10 minutes later, she rolled up. I thought, boy, they're really playing this thing to the end. <laughs> and listen, when she got out, she was the old church lady Pentecostal. No disrespect intended. She was the real deal. And in between sentences, she praying the Holy Ghost. Why is she talking to you? Good morning, brother. <laughs> I mean, had the, I mean, the fire in her. Come on, somebody. I wasn't scared of it. I wanted to cuddle up to it. I was like, hey, give me some of that. Come to find out, she was a pastor and the principal of her own school, a true Pentecostal holiness church. And every morning, she'd been driving out to our church and parking. And we only had half an acre and a church less than the size of this right here. And it was packed. We had to take the altars out, bring in chairs. We had people standing there, a little foyer, a vestibule. And, and they were sitting out there. We had people, we had Sunday school in the hallways, y'all. That's how fast we, I mean, it was the explosion of the power of God. I mean, it was boom. And so she comes in. I'm headed somewhere in the store, so stay with me. I had not on telling, so I'm having to get it when I go. And so, so uh, anyway, uh, she comes in there and she said, every morning I've been coming out and parking my van under your shade tree. And every morning that I'm coming, I'm praying, Lord, it's the day today because God told me he's going to sell me your church. And I said, really? She said, I got the money in the bank. And I said, okay. She got my attention now. You say money in the bank. This old I'm like, oh, yeah. Now we're believing in God. <laughs> So she said, this morning as I'm asking God, is today today, is this church for sale? I read your sign that says, this church is for sale. Seven days later, they signed a full contract on it and bought our church for asking price. Wow. Wow. Are you hearing me? Yeah. I'm like, that's awesome. I tell our people, we sold the church. They gave us stand up. I mean, yelling, crazy folks, crazy folks. And I said, now the problem is we got 30 days to get out and I don't know where we're going. They cheered at that. I, was like, <laughs> I can say it, it take hours to tell you the story, but I'll tell you long term is this. God provided a place. We shared a Baptist church. They gave us their old sanctuary that's connected to their new sanctuary. See, the 400 people had a baptistry, had 13 classrooms in it. And literally, we would pass their people and our people every Sunday, Pentecostal and Baptist. And their pastor would come down every Sunday and look for snakes every Sunday. To, I'm telling you the truth, so help me, I'm telling you the truth. I said, what are you doing? 
good. Stop looking for them snakes. Make sure this ain't Snake Sunday. Don't you keep them in there. You keep them down here. Don't you let them get down there. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all just don't know. I, I will tear a new doorway in this building for a snake to get away from. I'm just telling you. Call me a lack of faith or whatever. I call it good common sense, Lord of God. <laughs> when we voted to build our new facility, which was seven acres of land across the way, we borrowed this facility for two years while we built a facility. When we voted to build it, if we took 100% of every penny that came into that church, not earmark, I'm talking 100, every penny that came into church, not pay anybody, not pay a light bill. If you took every penny, not remaining, every penny, it would not make the payment on the building. And them crazy folks voted 100% to build it. We sent five, five packets to banks. They turned us down in less than 24 hours. Well, of course they did. We had $10,000 in the bank. <laughs> I mean, they don't give you $1.4 million with $10,000 in the bank. It just don't work that way. And then I'm like, I'm praying, man. I'm desperate. God, you told us to do this. And he said, I will build it. Okay. So I get a phone call. Gentleman says, is this Pastor Kyron? I said, it is. This is, Reverend, uh, this is Mr. Mark Haynes, Pastor Jeff. I, I, I work at so-and-so bank here in Sylacauga, which is about 30 minutes from where I live. And he said, I'm, uh, I'm one of the, uh, the officers of the bank, and I come across your loan. What are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, so I told him. He goes, whew. I said, Mark, all I can tell you is this. You don't know me. You don't know nothing. I will tell you, God said that we can build it and that he will pay for it. And I can tell you, I'll stand on his word. And I will promise you as a man of God who's heard from God, we will never miss a payment. Let me see what I can do. So he goes to his board meeting. He said, guys, I got this church. <laughs> and he tells them our story. One of the board members starts laughing. He said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, what, what's the deal? He says, is that Brother Calhoun? He said, yeah, Pastor Jeff Calhoun. He said, <laughs> he said yeah, uh, I'll sign on it. And then across the table, he laughs. He says, yeah, I'll sign it. He said, guys, he said, we're board members at West End Baptist Church. They're using our facility right now at the end of the year, at the end of the month. And he says, if he says they'll pay it, they'll pay it. He said, God doing something with that, folks. It's crazy. <laughs> Come on, y'all. And they loaned us. They loaned us over a million dollars just because I said, God said, I will build it. Yeah. And we never missed a payment. Because God can't break a promise. Now, them nutheads that say they heard from God, it won't take long to find out if they did or not. <laughs> they stand it by themselves. But they are still men and women of God out there that hear from the throne. And if the devil can get you to not trust in anybody, you're going to miss the body that God sends your way. Come on, somebody. If the devil can get you not to trust in anybody, he's going to make you miss the body that he sends your way. Mm. I got to finish. I got I to do that. I respect. I got to be done. Here we go. All right, you got the power of I, the promise of will, the process of build. The process of build. Jesus is going to use his own body to build his body. That's, listen, look at your neighbor. That's you. <laughs> look at that one. That's you. Now look at yourself. That's you. This, uh, quickly, we're going to hear the scripture. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. It says, And God gave some apostles and the prophets and evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge and of the Son of God. And I had to let your pastor preach that to you later. I don't have time. To mature manhood, to the measure of the stature the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and human cunning by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Listen to it. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped listen to this sentence. When each part is working properly when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love if you go a little further in Ephesians he starts talking about the hand can't say to the foot you don't belong here and the head can't say to this and he goes to teach a lesson about all body parts are equal and necessary in importance come on y'all matter of fact in 1226 he says if one member suffers all suffer together right. yeah. 
Mm. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Mm. There, there was a campaign slogan. I don't even remember which president is, so don't, don't hand me on politics, okay? But the thing was, we're better together. Now, we've heard that in churches. We've heard that in football programs. We've heard that. Have you ever heard that? said, we're better together. I've said it in my church. I'm sure I've, well, we're better together. But, you know, I, I question that. I think there's a time when we're better together. But there's times we're not better. The only time we're better together is when everybody is being their best. Listen, greeters, children's workers can never leave the nursery workers out, ever. Don't ever leave them out. They're, they're, they're one of the most vital things happening right now in this church. Right now. Because you couldn't hear me over some of them beautiful babies. I know y'all don't have noisy babies. At Lomax, we had a bunch of them. And they, you, people can't hear. They, they can't hear what's happening. But them people have that baby. They're loving those babies. So the people in here can hear what God's got to say. That's valuable. So you got greeters, nursery workers, praise and worship. Come on. Man, y'all got some praise and worship. You hear me? Brother Mark, oh my goodness, your crew. Woo-hoo. I about dance a jig over here. And I don't dance too good. I about come out of this coat. <laughs> And then you got a great pastor speaks. Oh my goodness, he's preaching. I listen to him every Sunday. Wow. Not just in content, but content and ability to communicate the word with love and power and authority. But if any one of them's off, the church is not better together. Because if you come in and nobody greets you, right? You don't make them feel loved and welcomed. I loved it. I went on your page and was looking at some of the reviews. And I loved so I felt welcome from the moment I walked on the property. Yes. If they fail, that's what gets noticed. Because immediately people's like, well, I don't know if they want me here or not. Exactly. So, so listen to this. The music can be awesome. The nursery worker can be bringing it, boy. They take care of them babies, cleaning them, giving them back all polished and clean. Your baby was an angel today, praise God. And you're like, yeah, it's got little gold stars on the forehead. They were so good. Just pat it on there. Man, look at my baby. You come through the forehead the long way. Just let everybody see the, the stars on your baby's head. Yeah, he, he was good today. And listen, and, and Brother Mark, and just tickle them ivories and bring it. He wasn't tickling them. I'm not sure what he was doing to them in the morning, but it ain't right. I'm just telling you. Because he was bringing them ivories today. And brother, listen, the pastor can get up here and bring the word. But let me tell you what they'll remember when they get in their car. Well, they sure wasn't a very friendly bunch. So we went better together that day. One of us heard us. But boy, when the greeters are greeting. I was blessed by it. I ain't gonna lie to you. I was like, that's what I'm talking about. She had all she could. Man, when they do their thing, and man, you feel like God is coming today, and it may be right now. And then, boy, the pastor gets up here, and he, whoo, he brings a word, and you're like, man, when they leave that day, they're like, I, wow, now we're better together. Now, there's a lot of positions I didn't list, like being a church person here. You need to be. I mean, I'm, I'm going to step out there, Pastor. They may never like me again, but I'm going to throw it out there. It's what I feel like. Most of you don't know this. Me and my wife attended this church a little over a year and three weeks ago. On a Wednesday night. Had a talent contest. And um, he sung, I Got Sunshine. We sat second row, right back here, right in front of this couple here. When we drove up, we had to Google again to make sure y'all had church on Wednesday night. Nobody here lights us out. Found out they did have church. So we waited out. We saw this little person come in the front door. I said, hey, door's on. Let's go. We walk in the door, and this gentleman says, they in there. Appreciate it. So we walked in. We sat down. We were early because that's just a bad habit I got. Everybody walked in. No one said a word to us. Not a word. Not a word. Did their thing, had their contest, left out. One couple on the way out, I bumped into them. And they said, well, we sure are glad you were here tonight. Where y'all from? One couple out of 28 bodies in this building, including staff members, said a word to us. 
after being here over an hour and a half. We're not bitter. Because <laughs> I understood. Because, see, I was here another time, back in the 90s. We had a district council for Alabama here. And this place was wall to wall. You hear me? Listen to me. They was greeters. You couldn't get your car without somebody saying something to you. I mean, you still arguing. Hold up, honey. Here they come. Hurts. How you doing? You still wiping the dust off your Bible. <laughs> Man, I remember we come in here this place. Listen, and this, they had more in the choir than you got in the pews today. This place was hot. Anybody back here in them 90s? Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's the glory. Listen to me. This place was the church in Alabama. I'm telling you, serving, oh my goodness. I remember trying to contact the pastor afterwards and say, dude, your church is kicking. They are servants. There is people there. This place was immaculate. I was asked every time I turn around, can you think we can do for you? And I'm thinking, just leave me alone. I'm just trying it. Yeah. I was here in the glory days. And I was here a year and a three weeks ago. The reason I'm not upset about that because I saw a group of people who were struggling, who loved this church and believed in this church. And they come week after week loving this church and believing in this church and wondering, will we ever see the glory? You know, there was a temple God talked about back in the day that had its glory days. Matter of fact, it said when it began to build the new walls, there was a crowd gathered around and he said half of them was crying and remembering the glory days and going, boy, do you remember the temple back in this day? Woo, that place was awesome. Do you remember? He said the other half was going, man, do you see what we're building now? And he said you could not distinguish between the weeping and the rejoicing. Come on, son. Somebody. You're not the first temple that's seen his bottom. Yeah. Amen. Now I stand here a year and three weeks later. Who would have thunk it? And I'm here at the rebuilding days. And there's an energy in this place. I was greeted like crazy out there. Some of y'all, you, you happy. Some of you crazy greeters. I mean, you just like, you just, you know, you ain't that happy. Yeah. That's the only time of the week your teeth show that much. I promise you. But y'all like, oh, we, we're welcoming people up here today. Welcome to the church. <laughs> here, take this donut. <laughs> I'm saying, listen to me. There's an energy in this room. I'm telling you, y'all, listen to me. There's a fire that's been kindled. There's a flame. Why? Because the promise never went away. I will build my church. Now you're in the process. You get to be a part of the comeback. Everybody likes a good comeback. Are you hearing me? Ever? Listen, there's a community out there waiting for no wood to have a comeback. They remember the glory days. They remember the impact on this community. They remember the crowds. They remember the blessings and they remember the power and they're waiting for you to come back and one day this place is going to be filled and one day the my church I gotta finish it I gotta get in shape you got the power of I the promise of will the process of build I love this one the priority of my we're his bride he's a jealous God <laughs> which means he got a jealous son because we his bride. And I don't know about y'all about you, how you are about your bride. I'm pretty touchy about mine. You want my mind? You better be looking her in the eyes. Because anything lower than that could get you addressed. It could get you checked out. Especially when she's wearing certain things. Because I would check you up quick. it would be in a good spiritual way. I'll be laying hand. I'll give you some of them Rod Parsley hand laying on. So I'll leave a bruise on your forehead. But you will be slain in the spirit. I promise you. Is she the same way about me? And who wouldn't be? <laughs> Come on, y'all. Hey, 
We start, I, have I got time? Y'all ain't hungry. Come on, you had donuts. <laughs> well, this, <laughs> this is truth, man, y'all. I'm telling you, you don't want to be, don't look at me because she go crazy. She go back crazy on you. <laughs> we were headed to a Christmas party. We were youth pastors. She hates when I tell this story, that's why I'm going to tell it. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> listen to me. She went in. I pulled under a Chevron. I had a, a Camaro because uh, I love Camaros. I have, I've had seven of them right now. I have a 1967 Camaro convertible. Mm, come on. Some, whoa, whoa, whoa. 327 with a two speed power glide. Woo! Purrs, baby. Let me. Mm. No, she screams. She don't purr. She screams. So back then it was just a 1990 Camaro. Very nice. Custom wheels, juiced up the engine. It was, it was a sweet ride. Back then, you could black out the windows all the way around. You couldn't see where you were going, but it looked good. <laughs> so we cruised up into the shell. She said, I want some milk. I said, well, go get you some milk, baby. So I pull up in there, and I'm watching her because she mine. She walk around the front door. She's strutting. I'm checking her out, top to bottom. I promise you. I'm a lusting because I can because she's my wife. And so she go in there, and I noticed the dude behind the counter sort of doing this number. I'm like, oh, no. No, he didn't. So then I noticed he being all friendly up in there. So she comes back in. I notice he's watching her all the way out. And I'm going, oh, no, you ain't. Now, we're late for a Christmas party that we're supposed to be at as, as youth pastors. Not fully saved yet, but I was working on it. <laughs> so I dropped that Camaro wearing that awning. I rev that big boy V8. Listen to me. I throw that clutch. Ooh, I'm smoke. And I'm looking at him the whole time. I shift to the sack and I'm getting sideways. I'm getting close. And I'm just looking at him the whole time. And I mean, I made it up all I can. And my thoughts is later, I'll come back and finish you because I know what shift you look for. Because again, I was still working on salvation. And so, man, I get done. I get out of the road. They smoke. I mean, you can smell the rubber burning. And I look over. This is where it went horribly wrong. My little wife, unknowing to me, had opened her chocolate milk and got it right about here <laughs> when I dumped that clutch. <laughs> I'm over here going, oh, yeah. I look at her and go, oh, there is chocolate milk in the studio. <laughs> she had a little blue cellar outfit. <laughs> and it is, it is down. She'll tell me if I'm right about that later or not. But that's the way I remember. And it went down. <laughs> and I looked and said, when you go home, let you change? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was a quiet evening. At my house. Yeah. It was, it was a long ride home, boys and girls. I'm just telling you. Yeah, I did to him. I hope I did. It was a waste of bad attitude if it didn't. I'm sorry, but my God who sent his son Jesus to die for me, if you don't think there's some jealousy there raging, how does a God that loves us without, without any resistance go from loving us to sending us to a place called hell? Because we're his bride. And there's just so much you can push him. And there's just so much you can reject his son. And there's just, he's a jealous God. He said, I will build my church that I'm going to shed blood for. Come on, y'all. Lastly, I know you're happy about that. Put your shoes on, lady. We're ready. You got the product of church. Go back to the revelation. Listen to me. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the last sentence. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That word prevail, listen, I'm going to take you back and give you a little study real quick. Prevail. I'm going to give you some Jeff. I'm going to I'll put it in our term we don't understand. I got it out of the dictionary for you and showed it where he was at out of the Greek and Hebrew. Here we go. To become so widespread that it is the only thing left. And the gates of hell will not become the only gates left. If we're not careful, we can look at this world and say, everybody's going to hell but me. <laughs> Everybody. I mean, hello. I don't see revival. I don't know how we're going to turn this thing around. I don't see this thing been going down, down, down. But I got good news for you. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell ain't going to be the only gate left because I'm the gate. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the lie. No man enter to the Father except through me. I have a gate. To, I've opened it wide and hell can't stop you. Listen, if a church, if everyone, everybody shout everyone. If everyone in the church is praying for the church, prepping for their service in the church, and promoting the church, it can't be stopped. 
Are you hearing me? you got to take ownership without dictatorship. What does that mean, preacher? That means you make every adventure, you make every piece of trash. That's my trash. Let me get to that. I don't know who dropped it. don't care who dropped it. This is my house, uh, and my house is going to be clean. Uh, it don't mean you walk in the preacher and say, preacher, now that I've taken ownership of this, i got some ideas. No, let him do what God called him to do as you are right now. Let him lead. Uh, but you get in behind him and say, well, he said we're having this event. Let's make this the greatest event that's ever happened in the history of this place. Uh, not based on yesterday's records, uh, based on what's yet to be done, praise God. Let's let the community see we're not the old school, we're the new school, praise God. And we're here to tell you we're about excellence, uh, we're about power. This place will never be dirty. I wish them cleaning people would clean up around here. I wish you clean up around here. You're part of the mess. Uh, do some of the cleaning. Uh, it's your church. We wanted to be our church when we got our idea about what we want. It either is or it ain't. I listen to a lot more people that work at the church than I do people just stand don't do nothing. I'm, a, I'm sorry, I'm being a pastor. I'm so sorry, Jeff. You don't have to invite me back. It's okay. I would like to come back, though. I really enjoyed it. Between his singing and her dancing, I was like, you. I'm done. Stay in your feet this morning. What does all this mean? <laughs> you can be a part of the promise or you can not be. Because the only part of that whole sentence that is, can be altered is whether you're a part of the process or not. Remember the verse I read? Peter, yes, you did it, buddy. Way to go, buddy. But if you go just a few more verses, he's telling Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Wait a minute. He went from, whoa, Peter. Peter going, yeah, man, that's right. I'm talking about. I need to step up right here. So he's like, get thee behind me, Satan. But it's me, Peter. <laughs> Remember what the problem was? He began to reveal to him that he was going to die. How he would be the Messiah. How he would be the Christ. And Peter said, no! No! That can't happen! I'll give my life before I let you die. He just looks. He says, get behind me, Peter. Because right now, you're thinking not with the heart and the mind of God. You're thinking with the heart and the mind of a man. And if we're not careful, we can get in here in this church and we lose the heart and the mind of what God wants. Because we allow our own fleshly man. And that right there will determine whether you're going to be a part of the process or a part of the problem. Come on, y'all. Because Peter in that moment, he defined some things. Something happened right there in that moment. You remember, Peter denied him. <laughs> but then Jesus came back. Peter saw him. My boy didn't even get his clothes off. He jumped over the edge of the boot like Forrest Gump. I mean, boop, gone. He swims ashore. Jesus. He said, Peter, do you love me? Oh, you know I love you. You know I love you. I know my actions didn't show it. And I know you were right. But I've been miserable ever since I cut the night. Peter, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? It's like enough every time you ask me that. I love you. You know I love you. I love you so much. Feed my sheep. Wait a minute. Feed them when they're babies. Feed them when they're grown. Oh, now we got some, we're showing some years ahead of us now. Peter, does thou love us me? Oh God, you know everything. And I know that you know in my heart that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Wait a minute, he just said feed your sheep. Now he's saying don't just feed them when they're young, feed them when they're old, and feed them from now on as long as they live. You're now a part of the process, Peter. enough of, of me in you to do it. He said, but oh, Peter, now you're there. <laughs> now you realize it's all about the love. Go serve me. Go, go be part of the process. The 
church, the product of the church. The church is where lives are changed forever. You ought to leave here tonight praying about next week. God, because this is where it happens. This is it, man. We can happen other places, but this, this is where it happens. The church where marriages are healed. The world don't have the answer, and the church has lost the answer for years. But a real church, a true church, a Bible-preaching church, undefiled and unworried about what people think about it. Marriages can still be made whole. Had a couple been divorced twice. Stand up one morning, walk down to that altar, kneel down. And he proposed to her after praying in their hearts to Jesus. That had been married for years, longer than all the other times combined. Why? Because they brought God into their marriage. You know, marriage can't heal. Suicidal kids, church, give them a love that's deeper than what they need out yonder. That some boy can't feel or some girl can't feel or some popularity or a hundred likes or ten shares can't even compare to at the church. That's the product of the church. Church holds families together. It's where deliverance happens from drugs, alcoholism. I've been an alcoholic in my life. I've been a drug addict in my life. I've been a lot of horrible things in my life. But thank God for the church. And as sure as it happened to you, it needs to happen to people you know. Preacher can't build this church. He won't. I don't care how good he is. There will never be a good enough preacher to build this house. The people build the house. got to be as excited in two years from now as you are two weeks ago. That same excitement every Sunday. Why, God ain't changed. You just got all used to it. Well, quit being used to it. See the foot. Listen, when you get used to your marriage, that's when troubles happen. You got to go back and talk about what it's all about. Remind yourself why she's so valuable to you. Come on, y'all. If you don't, she will. Just wait around a little bit. And if you don't hear it, she'll find somebody who will. Remind yourself why church matters to you every Sunday. Start telling people about it again. Amen. Father God, I love you so much. And there's so many things I want to say and do, but you're done. So I'm done. God, thank you for the joy and the liberty of standing on this platform in the midst of a time when a church is, is burning again. <laughs>